Good morning and welcome back. So, as I told you, I am going to look at the queries which have been raised one by one and instead of answering those myself, I am going to throw open the query to all the participants and would like somebody to answer the query in the true spirit of collaboration. First of all, I would like all of us to understand that we need not hesitate in giving an answer which we believe is okay, but we are not absolutely certain because together only when we discuss, we should be able to reach the right conclusion about any query. So, as I said about the submissions, the answers need not be perfect, but the answers should attempt to throw light on some other aspect of the issue or try to analyze the issue itself in more clearer terms. So, with this I will go over to the questions one by one. The first question that I have is from Sumit Kumar Agrawal. He had asked this question earlier that the smallest value was indicated as minus 2 to the power of 31 minus 1. He observed that if I use 2's complement form, then the smallest value will be minus 2 to the power 31. I had explained that if I use the sign representation, then the first bit could be 1 or 0 depending upon the number is positive or negative and accordingly the range was given as the minimal that a compiler must guarantee. He has written again saying that even if the first bit is regarded as sign bit, it will be 0 if the number is positive. So, the range of positive numbers is correctly represented as 2 to the power 31 minus 1 as being the maximum number, but even in 2's complement form, the first bit will be 1 and even if that first bit 1 represents a negative number, if represented in 2's complement form, the smallest uh, negative number will not be minus 2 to the power 31 minus 1, but minus 2 to the power 31. He wants to know whether that is correct because he said he wrote a small program and confirmed the largest negative value that he could get. Anybody would like to comment on this? Those of you who can comment on this may please uh, raise a okay, By the way, this time I do not want any new queries to emerge. We will have time for that later. I want you to ponder upon this question and request people to volunteer to answer this. Uh, please tell me whether you are willing to answer this query, otherwise I will come back from you and now onwards raise a button only when any participant wishes to answer a query because this is the mode that we are operating now, what I call the collaborative discussion mode where I will not be answering any query at all. I will first pass the question around and then we will come back uh, to conclude the discussion. Now, there is one more flag here Nirma Ahmedabad. So, let me go over to Nirma Ahmedabad. Anybody from Nirma Ahmedabad willing to venture to answer this query? Over to you Nirma. I will go over to all centers to find out whether somebody is willing to answer the query that is being raised. These are queries which have accumulated over the last few days through participants questions. So, we will first look at those queries. Please do not ping the center for any additional query at this juncture, but I would like you to volunteer to answer the queries that I am raising. Let me repeat the query. This was about the lowest value. Since nobody else has ventured to speculate, let me answer Mr. Sumit Kumar Agrawal. Unfortunately, this printout does not say where you are from. But the correct answer is, you are absolutely right. In most of the implementations, in fact, negative numbers will be represented using 2's complement form. And therefore, when you ran a small program to test it, you could confirm that your guess was correct. The point that I was making is not about a specific implementation or in fact about most implementations, which as I said, I entirely agree with you that most implementations will implement negative numbers in 2's complement form giving you a larger value of negative value that is minus 2 to the power 31 uh, and not minus 2 to the power 31 minus 1. 
the point I was making is that if you refer to C standard, the C standard prescribes the minimum values of all the limits that must be adhered to. Any particular implementation is free to exceed these limits. Exceeding is on either side. So, for example, if a maximum value is prescribed, an actual implementation may actually permit even larger value. If negative value is prescribed, somebody may implement something which goes into larger negative value. More specifically, the C standard comments on uh, the largest negative value. It does talk about the possibility of having two representations for 0 and it additionally says that if there are two representations of 0 in your implementation, you shall additionally do this, 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 this. So, I was referring to C programming standard and the uh, standard representation, not about any implementation. Uh, but you are very right, in most implementations, it is common sense to use two's complement form for representing negative numbers as you have pointed out and that is what we will see. So, I hope that answers your question. Uh, next question is by Hitendra Suryamanshi. In lab assignment 4, there is one program pi. In that program for different values of n, the values of real time, user time and system type changes. So, what exactly that means? Effectively, I read this question to say that if you run the program again and again, you may get different values. I have already explained that that could easily happen because at the time you run your program depends upon what other operating system processes were running in the background will determine the exact clock time. One. Second, the time command does not guarantee accuracy of measurement and therefore, we should not consider the exactness of value but rather the order of magnitude of that value. The next question is from PhD Tech Coimtur, M. Subhatra and Manjula Devi. Can you please clarify the space complexity of algorithm? Like time command, whether we have command to find space complexity of algorithm. Also, we need explanation for the word context we referred in wiki, but we can't get its exact meaning. So, this is question in multiple forms. First, I would like to ask our colleague participants whether anybody is willing to comment on the space complexity of algorithms. So, space complexity of algorithm, anybody from the remote centers, I would like you to ping me now if anybody, any participant is willing to comment on the space complexity of algorithms because we have discussed only time complexity. Anybody from ISRO remote center, nobody. Uh, that is not very fair by the way. As I told you, do not worry if the information that you give is not accurate or not correct. We will all discuss it and we will all come back with correct answer together. Please understand that even for, with 40 years of experience, there are so many things which I do not know. It is perfectly all right to either not know or to make mistakes. But it is important that we discuss this out and deliberate so that doubts are clarified to the extent that is possible that incidentally is the environment in which our students also should work. Here I will repeat the question. The question is we have discussed time complexity, but what is space complexity and is there any utility like time to calculate space complexity? Rajaram Bapu College has an answer. I can see them here. Over to you. Uh, sir, space complexity is related to storage requirement of particular algorithms. Suppose uh, input values, uh, if we are dealing with array, then uh, n, that n is nothing but uh, storage requirement. I think it is related to uh, storage requirement of particular algorithm. That is space complexity. Over to you. Okay. So, uh, the first answer we have got says that the space complexity is related to storage requirements just as time complexity is related to execution time. Let us go over to uh, KG Somaya has an answer and NIT Jalandhar has an answer. First, I will go over to KG Somaya. KG Somaya, over to you. Good morning, sir. This is Archana Shirke from KG Somaya. Uh, any algorithm we can calculate in terms of time complexity and space complexity. This is space complexity is nothing but the memory requirement for that particular algorithm. How much memory we are going to allocate when we are running that particular program. So, for example, uh, like a sort. 
if you if you are taking any type of sort like merge sort and all we can do the merge sort with the help of some temporary variables and all if you are allocating the same num, uh, same array for doing the temporary uh, ca calculations and all so then in that case the time complexity of that uh, particular algorithm will be depending on what is the memory you are going to utilize so if I, if i am going to utilize one or two variables then it can be a o of o, uh, one that is a uh, constant and if i am going to allocate the same array what is what is what will be the input to that particular algorithm in that case the complexity will be o of n which is very similar to the time complexity it based on what is what is the extra memory you are going to allocate for that particular program over to you sir uh, thank you very much it was a very elaborate answer <coughs> but i would like to make one point <coughs> After all, we are still discussing basic programming here, and the notion of time complexity and space complexity is merely to introduce to our students that there are associated costs both in terms of storage and execution time. So, while your answer is perfect, there is an attendant question that just like we have a time command to measure the execution time, do we have a command to measure the storage requirement? Because first-year students. will generally find it difficult to distinguish between algorithm and the program program is the current implementation whose actual time is being measured algorithm is the back end abstraction whose complexity as n tends to infinity is to be counted similarly what is the notion of storage complexity is probably the question but it was a good answer thank you so much amruta puri uh, i can see amruta puri apparently somebody there has an answer over to you amruta puri I think uh, space complexity is uh, uh, extra uh, space that is required for the program to run, and uh, not the space taken by the data or uh, the instruction. It's uh, extra uh, memory that is required when the program is running, like a, um, a temporary variable or an array that you allocate. Over to you. Uh, thank you. Uh, I don't entirely agree with you. Uh, the, the space complexity, incidentally, is related to the space requirement of the program. but you said it is not the instructions or the data but something else that is not correct uh, the space complexity is definitely related to the total memory used by the program which will include the instructions which will also include the data but mostly it is the data memory that is consumed which is supposed to indicate the space complexity in general by the way <coughs> there is a tacit relationship between the two because when you try to in, uh, enhance the time complexity of an algorithm usually the price that you have to pay is to provide for additional arrays additional storage etc etc so invariably when you come up with an algorithm which improves the time complexity sometimes the space complexity deteriorates that is it requires more space uh, we will close this discussion on this question here because the detailed discussion of this question is outside the scope of the basic computer programming but i am glad that uh, so many people had comments to make let me go over to the next question the next question is by tanushree chakravarti for the programming project can we use any other programming language other than c language answer is no this workshop is about c programming and therefore please understand that whatever you do ultimately will get contributed to the uh, national subject portal and since this subject currently is about c programming we cannot unfortunately put anything on the portal which is not directly related to c programming language of course eventually this programming portal may enhance itself to include programming in other programming languages but only at that time uh, you can submit any additional contributions which you wish to make the next question is by nitesh saxena from ims engineering college ghaziabad who is attending at triple it allahabad this query is related to c programming but not with first year students actually i am also teaching computer graphics in the lab of computer graphics students they have to write different c programs related to computer graphics my query is how to make the students understand about the graphics card programming and mouse programming because these programming topics are very complex and in very less time how can students understand these concepts what strategy i have to follow for the solution of this problem so let me uh, restate the problem that he is saying that just like we have written c programs to solve 
real life problems by simulating those problems or translating those problems into programming con context. He is asking a question, if he has to basically what he is referring to is embedded software or the embedded software which exists within the processors of graphic card and mouse, how to exploit that and how to use that by external C program that you and I write. More specifically, suppose I want to draw a picture through what I call raster graphics. That means I want to plot points on the screen given x and y coordinates. A graphics card is capable of doing that. The function, the graphic library that I use may also be able to do that. But if there are some additional features in the graphic card, how to exploit it using C? Anybody would like to answer this question? I will wait for any ping from users. I will, I will try to go over to Nirma Andhavad. Yes, I think they are now visible and let me see if I can hear them. Over to you. Yes, go over, I can hear you. Uh, as far as the graphics uh, utility is concerned, uh, we uh, generally include graphics.h file and we uh, initialize the CRT in graphics mode by uh, a standard function called as init graph. Before that, we need to uh, invoke a function called as detailed graph. And if we go into the uh, graphics.h, uh, I mean we can read that file and we can see different modes like CGA, uh, VGA and all those things. So detailed information can be uh, obtained from that graphics.h uh, which is legible or which is readable. Over to you sir. Uh, thank you very much. This actually does answer some part of the question which was raised. The question was I believe slightly deeper, having identified that the card is VGA or SVG or whatever, how do you exploit that further? I think the answer is correct that one should study in details the graphic.h or whatever header file is there which describes the features of the underlying hardware and which are exploitable by writing our programs. One thing however is that graphic.h is not a standard feature of C programming language. It is available on compilers such as Turbo C. However, there are other graphic packages which may or may not be able to exploit all the features of the underlying graphic cards. But in any case, they consolidate the graphic facility and give us. Since the question related to going beyond C programming language, we will stop the discussion here. But I am very happy with the answer that was given. I hope that answer gives some indication uh, to the original query that was raised. Let me go over to the next question now by Sachin Bara. How near pointer is different than the far pointer? Any particular situation is there when we have to use the far pointer? Uh, okay. The context is that we have discussed pointers in the class. He is pointing out that there is something called far pointer and near pointer. And what is there, what is the difference between them and under what situation we should use which pointer. So this is the question. I throw it open to all participants now. I will repeat the question. What is a far pointer and near pointer? What is the difference between these two and under which situation we have to use far pointer? So I will wait for a minute for somebody to volunteer. So far no ping from any AVU remote center. Anybody from the ISRO remote centers? No answer. It is very funny because when I came here after the tea break, even I did not know the answer. I had asked this question to about five or six people since yesterday and I could not get the answer. So I, today I just wanted to admit that uh, I don't know the answer and we will try and together find out. Somebody at SVNIT Surat has an answer to this. Uh, but I just wanted to tell you that I also found the answer recently, not directly, but my colleague, uh, Professor Abhiram Ranade gave me the answer. There is also an answer from Amruta Bangalore. Let me first go over to Amruta Bangalore. Okay, ASC Bangalore is live. Uh, over to you, ASC Bangalore. Uh, yes, sir. Uh, for a, a very small programs, so we can go for a near pointer. Suppose if you are going out of 64 KB, then you have to go for the far pointer. Okay, that's an answer. Uh, thank you. Uh, 
there is a there is a answer from NIT Jalandhar as well, uh, where the answer says, sir, near pointer actually stores a particular value at the subsequent offset memory address in the memory, whereas the far pointer stores it at a new base address with zero offset. Uh, let me see if there is any other uh, uh, SVNIT Surat has ping and JEC Kukkas has ping. Let me select SVNIT Surat first and see if we can listen to their answer. Unfortunately, I am still receiving blank video from SVNIT Surat. So, let me go over to Jaipur Engineering College Kukkas and see what is the answer they have in mind. I can see Jaipur Engineering College. Over to you. Hello, sir. Actually, sir, uh, when we want to locate the address which is out, uh, out of our program segment, then in that case we use far pointer. Otherwise, uh, if we, we locate the address uh, which is in our program segment, that in that case we use near pointer. Over to you. I hope you were all able to hear this answer. His answer was that if our pointer is pointing to a location within our segment, then we use near pointer, but if we have to access memory location which is outside our segment, then we have to use far pointer. Okay. So, let me act as a student and ask you the following question. What is the notion of segment in C programming language? How do I know whether I am accessing memory in so called within my segment or outside segment? As far as I understand, my program allocates memory all of which is accessible to me. So, what is this notion of segment is an additional question I will ask. So, let me tell you the answer that I got from Professor Abhiram Ranade and he got it from Wikipedia curiously. If all of you had seen Wikipedia, you would have got the hint. So, this is information from Wikipedia. In a segmented architecture computer, a far pointer is a pointer which includes a segment selector making it possible to point to addresses outside the current segment. Okay. So, let me comment on this. This notion of far pointer and consequently of near pointer is related to the architecture of the computer. More specifically, if a computer has segmented architecture such as Intel 8086, we are talking of really, really very old computers. When we are talking about those computers where the ordinary pointer is just a 16 bit offset with an implied segment, a far pointer has two parts, a 16 bit segment value and a 16 bit offset value, which together becomes 32 bits. And therefore, a linear address is obtained by shifting that binary segment four times to left and so on. Some details are given in the Wikipedia answer. Okay. Now, these, this notion of far pointer and near pointer would have been valid in the days when we were using segmented architecture such as 8086. First of all, to a computer programmer using a C programming language, when he sticks to the standard C, the notion of far and near should not bother him or her. My answer is therefore, that these are slightly dated notions and in modern programming, you may not require them. The wiki itself says, that on C compilers targeting the 8086 processor family, FAR pointers were declared using a non-standard FAR qualifier. Now, you have a uh, normalizing FAR pointers could be avoided with the non-standard huge qualifier. All of these are non-standard. As far as our programming is concerned, when we declare a pointer, we legitimately imagine that our pointer will be able to address all memory using the pointer value that is given there, uh, which is the correct uh, uh, situation. In short then, far pointer and near pointers could be meaningful if you are writing programs specifically for embedded systems which, yield, which use processors of the segmented architecture like 8086. But for all normal programming done on regular computers, there is no notion of far or near pointer which is necessary to be uh, used in our programs. Here is the next question by Prema Kala. How to solve the segmentation fault error? While I write simple C programs for implementing pass 1, pass 2 of an assembler or for designing a simple loader, sometimes my program is executing properly both in Linux and Windows, 
but most of the time it gives the error a segmentation fault in linux and b debugging memory does not leave enough memory space in disk uh, on windows is there any function in c to collect the garbage data like garbage collector function in os to overcome this problem i think garbage collection is a distinctly different problem segmentation fault is a distinctly different problem uh, but is there anybody who would like to comment on how why a segmentation fault should occur okay there is no response from isro remote centers there is no response from avu remote centers also uh, let me add my own bit to the confusion my own experience and the experience of many of my friends here is that 99% of the time a segmentation fault would occur when a pointer within your program misbehaves for example you have allocated memory to uh, dynamically but the malloc call returned a null value and you simply assume that the memory has been allocated and started going ahead with it or in some pointer computations that you are doing in your program the pointer becomes null alternately if a pointer is assigned a value which is way beyond the boundary of the actual memory which you are legitimately using consider a simple case i have an array declared with 10 elements i assign the pointer the address of the first element however by doing pointer arithmetic i can easily make that pointer point to 25th element for example whereas there is no 25th element now depending upon where that 25th element location is either the program might simply stop by giving an error or if it extend it is to 25 it is 25000 then it might try to access a memory which is beyond the memory segment allocated to you by the operating system obviously there will be a segmentation fault so while we have no answer volunteered from any other center my own take and i am not 100% sure of the answer either but whatever i have observed that whenever we have been able to trace the problem with a program which gives memory dump invariably the problem relates to a a, a pointer going haywire that is why you will not find these errors in normal programs which solve real life problems because there we either don't use pointers or we are careful with pointers but the problems will arise when we are trying to write system software such as compilers themselves or loaders or linkers you will find for example that when you are trying to test your linker or test your compiler you will get this kind of fault because that is where maximum possibility of a pointer going haywire because of wrong calculations exist the next question is by rajesh andhra loyala institute of engineering and technology is deallocation of memory for the block which is allocated dynamically is possible or not the reason behind the question is that in a c program if i dynamically allocate memory for 10 integer elements that is 10 into 4 40 bytes i use the a pointer to do that by saying integer star m alloc size of int into 10 so basically he's saying 40 bytes have been allocated now he reads data into these uh, uh, 10 elements after some time if he freeze the pointer if he says free ptr according to him free ptr should be deallocating the block which was dynamically allocated unfortunately what he says that after using the free function if for some reason he looks at that data again that is for all the 10 elements he says print f star ptr plus i he actually gets the same values again so his contention is after having deallocated how can my program still print the values so that means the memory appears to remain allocated okay so is there anybody to answer this question this answer relates to allocation and deallocation while in this workshop we have not explicitly discussed this but most of the colleague participants should be familiar with the notion of dynamic allocation of memory and indeed that would be one topic which eventually some of us will have to come together and contribute examples and explanations and slides so that all of that will go on to the portal 
Okay, SVNIT Surat has an answer. I am going over to SVNIT Surat. Mehul from SVNIT Surat. Normally, when we deallocate the memory, we inform now we release that memory. But until we again take that memory and do not write any value there, then the last value will be there. So we directly use the pointer and try to set memory. So it is currently whatever last value put there, it is given to us. So you just try reallocate the memory, rewrite the value, and then try to fetch the value. You do not get the last value. Over to you, sir. A very good answer indeed. I will just add one bit uh, of my own to that answer, but this is indeed the correct answer. Uh, so I hope uh, Mr. Rajesh understands what is happening. Uh, he has allocated memory, read some values there. Now he has freed the pointer and he observes that if he still reads the memory contents, he still finds the same value. The answer from SPNIT Surat was that that happens because Although I have deallocated the memory, that memory has not been transferred to somebody else yet. And therefore, before that memory is actually being reused by somebody else, the values will remain in that memory. So if I access that memory again, I will continue to look at the same values. However, his suggestion is that after deallocating, please try to allocate some memory to some other variable and assign some values to that variable, new values. Now if you try to go back to that pointer, you will find that new values come in. The answer is correct that the old values remain, but, to, but the way to check it is not very fair because when I ask for additional memory, I will get a pointer. This pointer will not necessarily be the same pointer. Please note that when I dynamically allocate memory, the memory is given to me by operating system. There is no guarantee that operating system will give me the same memory for some other usage. There is also a possibility that this memory will be used in a memory pool by the operating system to be given to some other process which is demand dynamic memory. So in general, there is no way to verify that my memory which I deallocated is being used by someone else or not. We have to depend on the fact that operating system is wise and clever enough that whenever I deallocate, it will sort of keep a track of how many bytes have become free and use it in its own pool to allocate to somebody else. But the other part of the answer is absolutely correct that even if I deallocate, unless somebody does something with that memory for reallocation, old values will remain in that memory and if I continue to access them, I will keep looking at the same values. Thank you very much for that wonderful answer. Anna University uh, also would like to comment. Over to you, Anna University. Sir, good morning, sir. We have an answer. So normally, memory once allocated, it will be there. When we use the free pointer, we are just dealing the pointer's connection to that memory. So anyhow, the value will be the same. That is the reason why modern languages, they are having automatic garbage collection, which can that values. In C, I, I feel that the problem is that because of uh, the, it does not have any automatic garbage collection. Over to you, sir. Thank you very much for extending uh, the answer further. Uh, what he is pointing out is that uh, when I free a memory, effectively for the operating system, it becomes a garbage. Meaning, what is garbage? Actually, it has my values, but as far as operating system is concerned, those are garbage values. Such releases might happen from multiple programs. So, consequently, operating system will keep having these pieces of memory. Garbage collection refers to an algorithm which will routinely look at all such freed memory from various programs and collect them into a single pool. Such a utility is called garbage collector. In fact, in Java, for example, when there is no notion of a pointer, but effectively whenever a dynamically allocated memory gets free, Java has a garbage collector which routinely runs. Even in large production systems, you can set an algorithm to run it say every 10 minutes or 15 minutes, which will keep collecting the garbage because for any new allocation, the memory has to be uh, made available. So we will conclude that these combined answers uh, uh, uh,
apparently respond to this question that in C programming language, there is no guarantee that after I free a allocated memory, that garbage has been collected by someone and therefore, the old values stay as our friend from Surat pointed out. AC Bangalore wants to add something. Let us go over to AC Bangalore. earlier question. So, we will consider the uh, dynamic allocation and freeing of the memory problem closed. He is revisiting the earlier question on the segmentation fault and pointing out that it is not just pointer uh, values going haywire, but in other cases also he has noticed a segmentation fault. Uh, let me give a final answer to this. A segmentation fault effectively means that the program which is executing is attempting to access memory which is not within the segment allocated to that program. And here I am not talking about hardware segment or segmented architecture. I am in general talking about a memory segment that has been given to our program. As to under what circumstances such a situation may arise that an instruction in the program is trying to access memory outside the segment, there could be a variety of reasons. I had indicated that pointer value going haywire is a reason which appears most frequently. But you are very right, that is not the only reason. There could be several other reasons. Unfortunately, there is no guaranteed way to find out why exactly the segmentation fault has occurred. The only way you can actually is to get the memory dump at the time the segmentation fault has occurred study the memory dump which is essentially a whole lot of binary code and then try to figure it out. Usually that is not a very productive approach and people try to relook at the program itself to try to find out what changes they could make so that the segmentation fault can be avoided. We will go over to the next question. This is by Vidya Jhope, VJTI Mumbai. How to pass command line arguments in Turbo C environment? Like in Java, she says, Java file name argument list. So, we know control F9 and alt F9 options. I am not familiar with turbo C. So, these options must be relating to our ability to give some command line arguments. I do not know. But how to execute this in Windows environment? So, the question is how command line arguments are passed in turbo C environment? Uh, anybody would like to answer this? Uh, SVNIT Surat has an answer. Let us go over to SVNIT Surat. Wait for one second. Yes, I can see SVNIT Surat. Over to you. Nehul from SVNIT Surat. If you like to pass the command line argument in the TC, then go on the command prompt, then go to the directory C drive TC bin, and then type your program exe file name. Suppose my file name is the test.c, then you just compile it. So it is generate the test.exe file. So on the command line argument, you type the test your program name, executable file name, then space and give the argument whatever you like. Suppose space.exe space, hello space world space and space 20 like that. Over to you sir. And it is also available on the many books. So, refer that books. Okay. Over to you sir. Thank you very much. Mehul, you seem to have uncanny expertise in C programming language. Uh, I look forward to having your continuous cooperation in our endeavor to build a very useful portal. Uh, thank you very much for the answer. It makes eminent sense. I hope the uh, people, those who use Turbo C would have understood this. Basically, in order to pass command line parameters, I have to give a command and I have to give a command on command line and that is the answer that he has given. Uh, I would ordinarily expect that any terminal interface from which I execute a program should permit me to write that command name followed by parameters. We have not discussed argc, argv in detail, 
but those are the standard ways in which C programming language defines how your program can get to see the parameters which have been given at the time of command line typing. VNIT in Nagpur also would like to have an answer. VNIT in Nagpur, over to you. Uh, sir, uh, Rohit Vaidya here wanted to answer, but uh, I think Professor Mehul from SVNIT has answered and he, he also had the same answer exactly. So, we do not have any uh, extra thing to add right now. Thank you. Over to you. Thank you very much. So, we have complete unanimity uh, on, on this answer at least. SC Amrutpuri also wants to answer. I hope they add some more dimension to it. Uh, let me see if I can go over to Amrutpuri. Yes, I can see Amrita Puri. Uh, what answer would you like to add? Over to you. Uh, to run a command line program on double C, um, if for example, if it is example dot C, after compiling it, we will get example dot obj file. So, for compiling, uh, for running that obj file with command line argument, we have in file option, we have a, we have to take up the dot shell and in that dot shell, we have to type that program and the command line argument program which is the obj file name and the command line argument. Over to you. Uh, thank you very much for your answer, but I am slightly confused uh, because I, although I am not familiar with Turbo C environment, uh, my belief is that it is not the obj files that you execute, but you need an executable or a dot exe file. At least that is what it appears uh, Professor Behul was trying to say. So, please cross check whether it is an obj file or dot exe file. I believe it is a dot exe file uh, and uh, that uh, you have to type the command com at a command prompt in the terminal that is of course common sense. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, we now have uh, okay, some questions on C programming. Why do the main program return a value? I think uh, we have seen this question. Uh, why do a main program return a value is because in C main program is also written as a function and every function can return a value if that is how it has been defined. However, if we describe the any function as void then it is not required to return a value. So, consequently in the main instead of saying int main if you see void if you say void main it will not return any value, but if you say int main it will be returning a value. Okay. Triple IT Allahabad Yes, we can see you triple IT Allahabad, over to you. So, I would like to answer the previous question that is argument count and argument valued in Turbo C. We have two options argument count and argument valued and followed by that uh, we have to use it on the command line that uh, we have to uh, mention the program uh, name and followed by the arguments that we have to mention in that program and then simultaneously it will be run as it is. Over to you sir. Uh, well, I, I appreciate that, but you will agree that is roughly the same answer that everybody has given. Uh, personally, I believe uh, Professor Mehul's explanation uh, was very candid and complete. We will take as the final answer that we have culled out after the collective discussion and we will go over to uh, other questions. So, here is a question by Jitendra Rathi, Jaipur Engineering College, Kokas. What is the default data type in C language? Would anybody care to answer this question? SVNIT Surat has an answer. So, let us go over to SVNIT Surat. Over to you. Okay, sir. Mehul from SVNIT Surat. If default data type for the function data type, return data type, then it is an integer. If it is for the any variable declared inside the program, then it is a compilation error, it is not allowed. Over to you, sir. Thank you very much, uh, Professor Mehul. Uh, yes, in fact, to the best of my knowledge, there is nothing like a default data type. You nicely distinguish between a return value, but that, that, that is a single value. It is not a, a data type is usually associated with a variable that we use in our program. The correct answer is that every variable or array or whatever must be explicitly declared, otherwise you will get a compilation error and this is not the right way to write the program. Let us go over to the next question. What happens when we use the bitwise operators with floating point numbers? I had, I had mentioned to you that bitwise operators will work on any sequence of bits. 
but the results will be unpredictable because there is no sense in using bitwise operators on floating point numbers. However, if you know the internal representation of mantis and exponent explicitly, then you can refer to the collection of 4 byte location and you can still do some meaningful operations by doing bitwise shifts etc separately on mantis and exponent. But ordinarily in, a, in terms of computations or in terms of writing any meaningful code, working on bitwise operators, working with bitwise operators on floating point numbers does not make uh, eminent sense. Uh, v. Narendra Kumar Vangala from NIT Varangal, is the use of AND in scanf statement essential? It is quite confusing to the beginners of C programming language. You have used in some function in lab to assignment where you avoided the AND symbol, but that too is quite confusing. Can't we come out with a new syntax in C where we can avoid the use of AND in scanf? I think we have discussed this question some teen times. In fact, the quiz that I conducted essentially revolved around the difficulty for youngsters to understand scanf and printf. But the answer uh, to define a new syntax in C, I am afraid is not a feasible answer. Language standards unfortunately are not defined based on the difficulty that we teachers have in teaching those syntax. So we will leave it at that. Uh, the next question from Hetal Kanubhai Gevariya, uh, Nirma University. What are the class and library functions used in using namespace std? Uh, we will pass this question because this is not related to C programming. We use this as I explained merely to permit us to use C in and C out and that we use as a temporary replacement of scanf and printf till we discuss those functions. So this should be a question legitimately related uh, in the context of either the either a subject on C++ or in object oriented programming. Uh, suffice it to say that namespace std is a concept from C++. There is another question which fox me completely, uh, Jairaj Pottekattu from NIT Calicut. We all know we are generally following von Neumann's architecture. Suppose I am using a Harvard based machine, how would this Dumbo react? So he is saying that the Dumbo's memory model and other thing are based on von Neumann architecture. Uh, is there anybody who would like to answer this question? As far as Dumbo is concerned, since Dumbo is my creation, I will answer to you. Dumbo represents the model that the programming language follows. Dumbo has nothing to do with the internal architecture, hardware architecture of the underlying machine. As long as on that machine, my programming language has been properly implemented as per standard specification and a compiler is available. I do not care what the underlying architecture is. So my Dumbo will truthfully represent the model of the programming as understood by the programming language. That is my answer from the Dumbo side. Uh, of course, I, I am not very familiar with the Harvard based machines. Uh, I am not an architecture person. Uh, so maybe I will request people if they can explain uh, what is a Harvard based machine. Perhaps we could go over to NIT Calicut and request uh, Professor Jairaj Potekat to himself to shed some lights on, uh, light on this. Uh, let me see if NIT Calicut I can see somewhere. NIT Calicut. So I am selecting NIT Calicut now. Let me see if your video is visible. Yes, the video is visible. NIT Calicut. Uh, is, uh, is Professor Jairaj there? So the request is, I already answered the question as far as Dumbo is concerned, namely he models the programming language and not the underlying hardware architecture. But I am curious as I am sure many of our colleague participants would be that one by one architecture all of us are familiar with. But when you mention Harvard based machine, uh, what exactly do you have in mind? Over to you Professor at NIT Calicut. There is no response from NIT Calicut. So maybe Professor Jairaj is not here. Uh, we will go over to the next question and uh, come back to this maybe at a later time. Rishiraj Vyas, Jaipur Engineering College, Kokas. What is the process for adding the user defined function to the library functions so that we can use it frequently in our whole project? I will repeat the question. 
this is in the context of standard libraries where we say include and we can use all the functions which are contained in the standard library. His question is that what is the process of adding user defined function to a library function so that we can use it frequently in the whole project uh, without having to redefine it again. Uh, anybody would like to answer that? Ah, SVNIT Surat. Can we go over to SVNIT Surat? Uh, Chandra from SVNIT Surat. Actually, whatever the function you want to define, uh, user defined function, you write in some file and send it as a header file. And then in your main program, you include uh, that header file and then you can use that functions. But while including that header file, uh, do not use the symbols like uh, that conventional symbol we are using with, uh, in an include statement like greater than and less than. But instead of that, you use the string uh, kind of a double, uh, double quote as in that you specify that header file. For example, you prepare a header file like test.h and in that test.h you are write, you write your all uh, user defined functions and then test.h file you in your main program, in your main file. Uh, thank you very much. I hope this answers the question. Uh, actually, there is uh, a, a further explanation of the correct answer that we saw and it relates to the search path. So, when you put double quote, there is a specific place where the linker will search for that particular function. If you use greater than less than, it will uh, search somewhere else. There are multiple ways of defining the path where your programs are written, but essentially that is the correct answer. There are also additional things such as separately compiled functions. I am very thankful that a very, very appropriate answer has emerged from Surat and this time from some other professor and not only from uh, Professor Mehul. Sona College, over to you Sona College. Sir, this is the answer regarding the previous question, the architecture dependence. Uh, actually, the compiler will take care of the, uh, what are the architecture. Nowadays, we have a GPC compiler. It will support uh, nearly 47 architecture. Whatever architecture we use, we com compile the C program. It will produce the base, depends on that architecture, the uh, executable code. Over to you, sir. Thank you very much. The answer given was the previous question. Uh, so, it was not related only to the hardware architecture or something. And the answer actually corroborates the point that I made. He mentioned that GCC compiler is capable of taking care of about 47 different architectures. That means it will translate our C program into an appropriate executable program with instructions for any one of those 47 architectures. So, really uh, the answer to that question was what I said that Dumbo was merely a model. But forget the Dumbo, even if we do not talk about Dumbo while introducing programming, all that we are re-emphasizing is that as far as we are concerned, our notion of programming is as seen from the eyes of the programming language. So, we presume that the capabilities of the programming language as defined in its instructions, etc., control structures, variable definitions, etc., all of them will be implemented faultlessly irrespective of the underlying machine to which the program gets translated. Thank you very much for further clarifying this. VNIT in Nagpur uh, has uh, some additional comments to make. Uh, over to you VNIT. Uh, sir, I will uh, just like to uh, extend uh, the answer uh, given by SVNIT Surat regarding uh, the addition of our functions into libraries. So, uh, professor over there has uh, correctly answered that question, but I will just like to add a couple of points. Uh, first point is uh, like uh, even if I have a set of uh, uh, set of uh, files in which different functions are written, I can bundle them together uh, into a single library and then uh, use it as if uh, it, it is more like uh, uh, the standard provided library just like as you said path has to provide it. But an additional point I want to uh, just make over here for the uh, benefit of participants is even while compiling that library we, uh, we can compile it using uh, either as a statically linked library or dynamically linked library. And uh, the, the advantage of dynamically linked library would be uh, that the development of library itself can go on parallelly as the development of the main program is going on provided all the prototypes are in place and they are in order. So this is the only extra thing that I wanted to add. Obviously this statically linked and dynamically linked they come with their own advantages and disadvantages. But I think this is one extra point that we can tell our students which will be helpful for them in the real world of uh, computer programming in industry. So that's all from my side. Over to you sir. Thank you. 
thank you very much for providing the additional explanation for the participants uh, who are not familiar with the static uh, linking and dynamic linking. I would just like to add one more comment. Uh, all of you would have heard of DLLs, you know, uh, these DLLs you find in Windows environment. Uh, the corresponding thing in Unix is SO or shared objects. So, if you see files with dot SO, they are shared objects and they are dynamically linked uh, library uh, objects in the sense that when you compile a program and link all of them, you actually dynamically link things. Uh, let me also elaborate on the difference. If I want to run my final program, then that program will require a runtime environment at the back where the runtime support for these dynamically linked libraries will be available. This is all right if that environment is available to me, but if I want to compile a program, link it, then take the executable file somewhere else and execute it, it will not run if I have used dynamically linked libraries. So, I think this is exactly what uh, VNIT had in mind when they mentioned that there are advantages and disadvantages. But thank you very much. Together, I think we have got a lot of elaboration on, on this particular uh, query. Okay, I think I am at the end of the queries that I have over and out. Thank you.